this is a, a round table to discuss the recovery. And we're holding this meeting in the context of Age of Economics, which uh, I think all of you except Ian have uh, contributed to. And we hope Ian will join us another time. And um, the three of us uh, got together. There's myself, there's Julian and Fabio, who are also here. But maybe, uh, maybe I'll just start off by saying that we came together with this group to basically put together people like you to really explore issues about economics and, and capitalism. They said, we're going to talk today about the recovery. And many of you have answered some very fundamental questions about uh, economics and policy. And we've, we've pre been in touch in, to various degrees on various aspects of the recovery. But we want to really apply some of these fundamental issues to understand what governments, what policymakers should be doing and how they should respond to the, the problems of the day. Um, so, Fabio, perhaps you want to say a few words? Yeah, hello to everybody. Um, uh, I know somebody already, uh, Professor Kirman. Buongiorno. Uh, hello to everybody. Yeah, my name is Fabio Dondero. I am a filmmaker based in Berlin, basically. I'm coming from Italy, but yeah, since uh, more than 30 years in Berlin, so in Germany. Um, yeah, we had a little bit this idea with Julian uh, um, to ask some questions, to ask some fundamental questions about economics and capitalism, because uh, I mean, it's not really difficult to, to imagine why we are in a phase, in a historic phase, uh, which is, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, also an opportunity with this uh, uh, COVID crisis uh, um, to think about what is happening uh, at the moment and find maybe solutions. I have to say I'm not an economist, so I have the privilege of ignorance. Yeah, that's uh, a very good privilege for for economics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we envy you. <laughs> so I can, I'm, yeah, don't expect many intelligent things from from myself. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to listen what you are saying and getting inspired. Yeah, maybe Julian can say also something. And hi, uh, hi everybody. I'm having uh, some technical problems with my camera. I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> welcome everybody, Alan, Ian, everybody, Patrick, hi Megan, Julian, Karagessian. So I'm one of the um, co-founders of this site. I work for the Canadian Treasury, the Finance Ministry. Mm -hmm. I also teach at McGill. And we thought about this project as one of just many efforts going on around the world to look at just the, the economy, the national economy, the global economy in a different way. And the way we see COVID, I think, is I, I, this, this remark has been made over and over, but it's, a, it's an accelerator. It's kind of a time portal. It's accelerated many things. And we hope also it's sparked a, a wider awakening, a wider consciousness of one problem that we face is this, the way we look at the world with the, with the so-called worldly philosophy, uh, uh, economics. And so that's why, uh, that's why we're here today to talk, about, um, to talk about a systemic recovery and in a way that is, I think, more comprehensive than some of the orthodox and mainstream uh, roots that we're seeing. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to, uh, to, to everyone and to, to William. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Thanks, Julian, Fabio. Uh, so I think maybe we'll just get straight into it. And uh, maybe we could start with, uh, first of all, I don't want to moderate this because this is more supposed to be an informal conversation. So please feel free to jump in and contradict uh, if you hear something you don't like or uh, reinforce if uh, you do like it. But um, maybe I'd like to start with Alan Kerman uh, because Alan, you've said before that um, you think recovery is not really what we should be aiming at and we need something more radical, more like Renaissance. So maybe you could start us off by sharing some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole point is that I, this morning I, I picked up the uh, Economist and looked at it and it said two things. It said, you know, once we're back to normal, it said, mm -hmm. and then it said later, uh, we have to decide what we're gonna do depending on what some authority or other thinks the output gap is. And so- oh, both God. Both those things. 
once again, we're stuck in this idea that there is a normal, we're going to get back to it, and we should get back to it. And uh, the only problem would be if we sort of try to get there too fast, something like that. And that seems to me such a totally wrong view of the world. We, we are in a, a world which is changing so much, so fast, that you shouldn't think of it as coming back to an equilibrium path. You should think of it as evolving mm. all the time and look and try and see where we're going, what the patterns are and where we can influence it. I mean, there's so many things going on right now. Uh, I, I just listened yesterday to the interview with the head of Volkswagen. And he was relatively conservative. He said, you know, I don't think that we can stop making petrol engines before, 19, uh, before 2035, he said. He said, but we are much more conservative than other people. And, you know, so this is a huge <laughs> thing. And this is going to be a change in the structure. And he said, I'm not, I think people will still want their own vehicles. I'm not sure about that. And so forth. And then he, then he went on to say, I think the people, the leaders in this uh, field are going to be people like, Tesla and so forth, and maybe we'll try to catch up. So, he, and he said, you know, cars are going to become software. So, with all those changes going on, should we be talking about the output gap as we used to measure it? I mean, it's almost as if you were looking, you're moving into war, World War Two, and then you're asking people, but well, what's the output gap? You know, when you're going to start making tanks and uh, and and doing things like this and doing things completely differently? I don't think that it just seems to me the wrong way to look at it, that we're navigating in a world which is changing faster and faster. And it's not an ergodic world. It won't, tomorrow won't mm. be today. And so uh, I think, I mean, even the uh, Geneva Association of Insurers, they said, look, we have to stop calculating premiums on the basis of previous experience. Um, what we have to do is worry about the evolution in the future and it, the tomorrow will look not much like today. And if we keep trying to base our uh, judgments on extrapolating from the past, we're going to be in huge difficulties. And I think mm. that's exactly the point. And somehow we haven't got it yet through people that we're not looking to some state to which we're going to get. And then we're going to look at how that's going to work. And then we'll be you know, back to normal. Now, I don't think there is a normal and there probably shouldn't be. But so that, that's my objection to the way people are looking at it now, despite all the talk about change and uh, greening the economy and so forth, they're still thinking in terms of getting it back on track in some sense. And I think mm. that's where we, the, this is really an occasion to get us off track and onto a better track. Mm. Yeah, so can I, can I that's my basic, basic point, sorry. No, that's Go ahead, Megan. The entire debate in the U.S. where I'm sitting right now is about the output gap and how big the oh, output God. is, <laughs> we're filling in the hole or whether we're overfilling it. Um, and I agree with you that that's the wrong way to frame the debate, partly because we have no idea how to measure the output gap or potential growth. But along with your argument that we shouldn't be trying to get back to normal, the goal is GDP growth still, which is a pretty antiquated goal. Um, and so not only are we trying to get back to equilibrium, but we're trying to get back to some kind of equilibrium that we've framed as GDP growth, which you know isn't particularly inclusive, doesn't measure a lot of things, does measure a lot of other things that maybe we shouldn't. So I, I agree, we probably need to have a wholesale rethink of what our actual goal is here with some kind of recovery. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just to briefly respond to that, Megan, I think that's exactly right. I mean, if normal is continue to extract stuff from, the, uh, from our planet and then throw it back in the air and then worry about how we can uh, sort of diminish the consequences, that doesn't seem to me the sort of normal we want to get to. And yet, mm. uh, you know, if you're measuring GDP, there are many things. We know all, all the problems with GDP. I think everybody here knows that even better than me. You know, if tomorrow we found, uh, let's say, a cure for, um, the, for COVID, for example, that might well uh, reduce GDP because all that expenditure <laughs> going into finding other ones would disappear. But, but that would be an absurd measure of uh, whether we're better off or not. So, but anyway, I shouldn't keep rattling on. I think, more, <laughs> as, as, as somebody said, more intelligent people should intervene. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Julian, did you want to say something? Oh, I just wanted to say uh, briefly, I just wanted to also introduce uh, someone who's just joined the Age of Economics, uh, recently agreed to come on board, which was very kind, uh, William Faisal. He's a graduate student uh, 
at McGill. I had the pleasure of teaching him a couple years ago. He's uh, one of the top students there. So he's, uh, he's with us also here. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. Thanks. Uh, welcome. William, uh, that's very unusual in North America. I thought you'd be at least called Bill. No? <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember they tried to call me, when I was there, they tried to call me Al. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't doesn't work does it um steve do you want to comment on what you've heard so far yeah well i've um I, I, as usual we're listening to naive neoclassical economics trying to talk about a return to a textbook equilibrium and the reality is that that um framing is still going to win okay mm. it's bullshit um that's why i'm happy to enroll my eyes at it every time i hear it but when it comes to the uh, political circles that listen to that stuff, that's what they understand. So whatever we say, we're going to lose to that in the first round. Charming start. Now, okay, I think so... we have to be ready for a second round. <laughs> and that is that I, what, I, what I'm seeing from one... Like I had a discussion today for my podcast uh, about apparently claims by some of the central bankers that savings are going through the roof right now massive levels of savings. Therefore, when we get past COVID, there'll be a dramatic increase in expenditure and the economy will bounce right back. Now, that's based on the standard um, uh, macroeconomic identity of in income equals consumption plus investment plus G minus T plus X minus M. And when you do the calculations now, what you've got is a large fall in C, not such a large fall in Y. So what you find is that's your, the, the gap between the two is what you define as savings. It's just a, it's a accounting identities with national accounting elements to it. Reality is that that doesn't take into account at all of people borrowing money because the, even the consumption doesn't include expenditure on financing your levels of private debt, your servicing your debt levels. So what people think the savings is occurring is not turning up in the bank accounts. And I wanted to show one indicator of that if I can um, share my screen, is that possible? Thank you, right. Now this is part of me is being slightly complicated to look at. This is a new software package I'm working on. And I've just pulled in the BIS database of private debt. This is why we're having the conversations. I haven't got a lot of analysis done. But this is the level of private debt for the Euro area, United Kingdom, and the United States. And you can see what's happening under COVID, okay? 10% of GDP increase in each. That's not people saving money. That's people going in further into debt. <laughs> and the reason, and that's in six months. That's only, so that's, that's between... That's 2020, that's June 2020, okay? So we're likely to see a 20% increase in, in debt to GDP in, in the year 2020, 2021 and go beyond it. So what we, when, when, our, when our standard output gap economists are getting ready for a boom, this is what's happening to bank accounts in the background. So I think they're gonna be blown out of the water by what they don't expect to see, which is a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So my feeling is the best way to attack this is to expect to lose round one because we'll never convince anybody anyway. I've had 40 years of experience of not convincing anybody anyway in the, in the, in the uh, main administration. You just got to be ready for things fuck up and they're not ready for it. So this is the fuck up that I expect. Okay, uh, great. Well, so uh, a financial crisis. Maybe, Matthias, you've also speculated in that direction. Do you want to say a word? Mm. The that it's not, maybe I've got... My, my, my camera gets in the way of me seeing the stop. There we go, good, okay, okay. thank you. Very good. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, so, so I, I don't think we, we know enough to, to know that it's going, if this is gonna create a financial crisis or not. Uh, in True, yeah. Because I think the, uh, the central banks have reacted in, in ways that are much more uh, aggressive than, than what they have done uh, in the past and, and, and even more aggressive than what happened in, in 2008. Uh, so that would be the only way, the only reason why we're not going to get a financial crisis, by the way, is because of, <laughs> of uh, uh, tremendous intervention. Uh, but, but what I wanted to, to jump in was, was on the possibilities that the crisis of the COVID crisis open up for uh, 
thinking about modeling and, and how economic modeling could be coupled with other types of modeling. Because uh, if, if, you, if you are a mathematician or, or mathematically inclined like I am, it was a, a golden opportunity, COVID, right? So uh, ev everybody was looking at curves and, and exponential growth and, and then uh, decays and flattening the curve and so on and so forth. So we even had uh, jokes that, you, you know, uh, we'll never have to uh, uh, be embarrassed when a student in calculus asks us, uh, when am I ever going to use this uh, curves in, in, in life, in real life? There you have it. The New York Times is talking about uh, curves and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but, but if you look at what the epidemiologists were doing, uh, you, you know, the, their modeling were very different from what economists uh, do when they would mm. look at a similar phenomenon. So uh, the, the most popular models uh, that got to the, you know, first approximation were, were very right and, and, and got to, you know, the uh, essence of the problem were uh, kind of simple relationships between groups. And these are the so-called CIR models uh, that the one thing that they completely ignore is the type of uh, rationality and equilibrium and, and, and uh, expectations mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. It's all about, you know, you have a big group here and have a big group there and, and there are uh, observed relationships between them, like when uh, people uh, become infected, when people recover and, and so on and so forth. And let's just model those relationships as we see them and, and, and pay attention to uh, the uh, a little bit about the uh, uh, biology and, and the, the how the pathogens work and so on, but don't try to uh, second guess and 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 attribute ultra rationality to the humans that are involved, <laughs> not the pathogens, but the humans that are involved in it. And, and, and then those, uh, th those are the kind of first pass models. But then if you look at more uh, detailed ones, they were agent-based models that again, were trying to capture what people were actually doing, uh, mm -hmm. not how people ought to behave. Uh, so, so there were models that were looking at how people uh, uh, move around in cities and how they go to school, how they go to large uh, 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 public venues and, and so on and so forth. And then what do they do when there is a, a, an intervention? So if there is an intervention, they're gonna change their behavior and they're gonna change their behavior in accordance to what's happening around them, not in accordance to some, uh, you know, future expectation extrapolated to infinity and looking at, you know, in, a, in an overlapping generation model, how uh, their, their offspring is going to react to, to what they're doing now to their, to their uh, changing behavior. So, and, and, and again, this worked, right? So you've got a, you've got a lockdown and you've got some, some intervention and you've got some reduced mobility and you put that in, in the model and, and see how it works out. And you follow the path and, and, and not assume that there's gonna be a, 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 a equilibrium, that there's gonna be a, a, a type of return to normality that the island was, was talking about, you just follow the calculations and, you, and, and, and the computations that the agents themselves are doing, they kind of inform uh, what the model uh, is, is going to provide. And, and, and it turns out that those models were quite successful and, and predicted mm. uh, uh, in the short term uh, what, what the effects of policies are going to be. And they were the guides for uh, governments and public agencies. Now enter the economists, right? So you, the, there have been several papers that try based on the big success of what the epidemiological models were doing and say, okay, now let's combine this with economics. And I say, okay, well, let's keep these variables about the disease and groups and the population and so on, and let's model the effect on the economy. All right, suppose there's a central planner <laughs> <laughs> and then go on and on and on, right? Oh and, 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 and it becomes just something that, that the two hands don't talk to each other. On the one hand, you have uh, uh, some uh, uh, real disease that is propagating through the population and you try to follow it as it's happening and the behavior that people actually have. And then, and then you superimpose that some kind of uh, economic uh, equilibrium and rationality that doesn't, doesn't really match. And, and so, so I think it's, a, it's a, an opportunity to try to then 
push the, the framework and the methodology that is being used in other uh, sciences, for example, epidemiology, inside uh, economic thinking. And, and, and if we have time, we can do the same analysis for climate change. It's the same story. <laughs> Right, uh, you try to do uh, economic of climate change, and you you are pushing together two methodologies that don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. I agree with all that, um, uh, uh, Matthäus, and I think uh, even worse in some sense, uh, uh, what what you've got is in fact so two complex systems interacting, and one is being modeled as a very sort of simple thing, but all the uh, sort of action in the one is being attributed to the clever individuals and all in the other we have p things or people following rather simple rules and I, th there's this famous quote from Leon Hufford which I can't remember exactly but he said economics is all about hyper intelligent people uh, in, a, <laughs> in a rather simple world um, trying, to do, trying to do things and work out how the world works and the, whereas the other sciences typically have uh, very simple uh, individuals or particles in a very complex world. But uh, he said the second he thought was a much better explanation than uh, mm -hmm. the first. That is, we attribute an enormous amount of intelligence. And one of the people that we were, uh, uh, William was talking about getting involved, Mike Woodford, who is a sort of guru of uh, rational expectations of DSG mm -hmm. and so forth. Mike wrote to me recently and he said, you know, since I've completely gone off uh, rational expectations. <laughs> what? Uh, Finally. I, I, <laughs> I think uh, I'm really looking into other things with neuroscientists and, and, and uh, so forth. I just don't think rational expectations. But he said that on and off for a while. But, you know, you want to say... Oh, maybe it's fine. Maybe he's saying into John Hicks. He's a nice guy, actually, unlike a lot of the neoclassicals. He's a nice person. <laughs> so he might actually do a John Hicks and change to a post-Keynesian late in his life. <laughs> right. Well, you know, uh, uh, but I think... It, this is the spirit of the sort of things that uh, Matthias is talking about. Is really yeah. it comes from artificial life. Do you remember the Santa Fe stock market? Yep. The simple yeah. things you put together, and then you watch what happens as they interact with each other and generate the activity that's going on, and not sort of some amazingly sophisticated guys who are sort of seeing generations in front of them and working it all out. I mean, you know, how far do you see? I don't know. <laughs> I don't <laughs> see very far. Well, maybe it's a uh, time to hear from Ian Hughes because Ian has uh, has a very deep understanding of individuals, and in particular when things go wrong and they have disordered minds. Uh, okay. But uh, perhaps Ian, you could uh, take it from there. Thanks, William. I guess I have, I have a confession to make, like Fabio. I'm not an economist. No. Not a confession. You're simply bragging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I guess going back to what what we started with that. The question you asked Alan William about recovery, you know, and so I think what Julian was saying, there are parts of what's happening, you know, the past events that's trying to drive us back and will try to drive us back to what was before. So you could call it recovery. But also, as Julian said, there's an acceleration that parts, you know, various things are, are accelerating and, and upsetting that it drive to, to recovery to what was before. Huh? And I think to my mind, what I would really, and I think it's begun to happen. I think one of, maybe one of the most, I would hope that one of the things that will persist after the pandemic is that economics has been knocked off its position of mon monopolistic dominance of society. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I think if that, happen, if that happens, then we get change. We don't get recovery. Yeah. Um, mm. So you've seen in the pandemic uh, that the you know health aspects have overridden economic aspects in many parts of the world. Yeah, people's view of of care workers has gone above those who are working on really intelligent stuff and in, in financial. I'm saying that kind of tongue in cheek, really intelligent <laughs> stuff in financial in financial markets and so forth. Mm. I think that's the paradigm shift we need. We need a paradigm shift that's one of value, yeah, and one that values other means of ordering society above an economic ordering of society. And I think that's, you know, as I say, that's we, one of the shocks from the, the pandemic is that that has happened. Yeah. Mm. As I said, there'd be huge forces trying to push that back again to reassert the primacy of economics. 
But I think what may have happened as well is that we've begun to reimagine and begun to imagine if economics is knocked off its prime position, what will we not miss about capitalism? You know, have that conversation. What would we not miss? Injustice, mm -hmm. violence, dominance of oil you know, economies, war in the Middle East, you know, the list could go on. What will we not miss about capitalism? Right? What, could pick, what then becomes possible if economics isn't the driving force in society? And I think there's a lot of there's a lot of groundswell of that type of thought already, which the Beyond Growth Report was tapping into. Mm -hmm. The other strands of, of sort of less dominant strands of economics. Um, but I think it, I, I would agree with Steve in terms of in the short term, neoliberalism will win unless that shift can happen. But I think in the longer term, it's driving us back into the types of, you know, the uprisings, the it's social dislocation, levels of inequality. It's driving us into a completely un unworkable society and a failure to address global challenges. So they may win in the short term, but if it wins in the long term, we're all done. Mm -hmm. Megan, <laughs> you should say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess maybe um, I might be an apologist for a second, which I'm not usually, but... Uh... I will say that policymakers in the developed world are at least trying to use this crisis as an opportunity to address the next one. So in terms of resilience as part of this recovery, we're probably doing better now than we were in the past. I mean, there is a huge drive for climate and to address inequality and digitalization all using antiquated frameworks and not going far enough, but it, there does seem to be some awareness among those in power even that what Ian Hughes is saying right and that we're working towards an unworkable society. Um, so it's not, it's not good enough, but it's something. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if, um, if we look at the response to the last crisis, then uh, certainly there was a lot of discussion about a green recovery back then and mm -hmm. the fact that we needed green growth and inclusive growth. And we tried to bolt on all these additional considerations onto our standard way of thinking about things. And it was rather underwhelming. So again, this time we hear a lot of people talking about resilience, but uh, from my perspective, we're using the words and we're talking a lot about environment and structural transformation, but it seems to be mostly words in the sense that we're not displacing the traditional framework or way of thinking about things. We're just trying to add these things on. And uh, maybe that's not the way we can do it because it's not just about trade-offs and managing these things. It actually requires, as Ian was suggesting, much more fundamental shift in the way we think about all these systems and how they're interacting. But remember, William, after the first crisis, one of the things was big promises to spend a lot of money on infrastructure, right? That was what we we're gonna do, big investments in infrastructure. And then you, today, you look at the television and you say, wow, Texas has been hit by a snowstorm and uh, I've forgotten how many million people are without electricity. And they say, this is due to the really uh, bad functioning of the power thing, but nobody has been spending money on that infrastructure. And so, in fact, these promises to say, you know, we're all going to invest in infrastructure. In fact, it, uh, it hasn't been done. And, and what I'm worried about, all this talk about resilience, green uh, transition and so forth. Like, I'm, af I'm afraid that people say that as a sort of, they know that that's an argument that will appeal, but I'm not sure how much is actually going to get done. And I think that's the person think, yeah. who asked about that is Igor, Igor Linkov, for example. He sitting there in the... Uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Department of um, uh, what, what's his called? Uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Army Corps of Engineers. You know where they couldn't even manage to sort of deal with the dikes in uh, uh, New Orleans because of a total failure to invest. And I, I have a horrible feeling that we're going to keep using, as William says, these phrases. You know, like, well, really got to boost infrastructure. But when you go and see even the New York subway and so forth, you realize that that does hasn't been happening. And it was mm. short term. Uh, still short term, cutting the costs, uh, trying to keep the thing running, and we're not still moving over to 
a, a world in which we'd actually try and make things function better for people. And, and that we could do that. I mean, infrastructure would be a, uh, I mean, even a stupid thing. Okay, here's, here's Perman's plan for <laughs> changing the world. Okay, a, a plan which is rejected by anybody with an IQ over 50. But um, <laughs> does that include most politicians? <laughs> it includes quite a lot of people. But, um, <laughs> now, the, imagine you said the following. We're just simply going to bury a lot of these power lines. Then everybody say, well, much too expensive, much too expensive. But every year we have millions of people without electricity. Why? Because wind and snow and so forth blow the power lines down. Okay, people can explain to me that, well, with high, high voltage power lines, that's complicated. But there are countries that don't have power lines above the, uh, above the surface, like Holland. Go to Holland and you, you're shocked when you come from Belgium. Well, where did they all go, all the, all the power lines? They're not there, they're underground. And so Holland doesn't have this problem. I mean, it has, maybe it has other problems, but uh, 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 what I'm saying is that that's, that would be a stupid thing. You know, people used to say about Keynes, well, he just wants to dig, have people digging holes to keep them occupied. But instead of digging holes, or at least they could dig the holes and then put these power lines in them. But this is just a stupid observation. But there's so many things we could invest in, which would make life better for people. That um, I'm just surprised that it, it's all talk, you know. And, I, and now the idea in the United States apparently is, well, we're going to do this, but we're going to do this in the old fashioned way. We're going to pass a bill and we're going to attach onto it a bit of inf infrastructure for every senator in the House for, and, and every representative in the House. And then they'll all vote for it. But if that's the only way to get it done, that's kind of disastrous, right? I, mean, I think part of it, oh sorry go ahead go ahead Mary. I was just gonna say I mean I think uh I might disagree with you on you know climate and inequality being part of the discussion after the last crisis in oh. the U.S. at least climate might have been something that was thrown out occasionally but absolutely no one was serious about it until about two years ago and then in the U.S. at least people started to really talk about climates and the and the private sector started to at least feel like they needed to make this ESG marketing scam appear to be serious. <laughs> um, so you know, I think I think now it actually is this, a a real topic that everyone really is concerned about. I mean, as mm. as an economist, you can't join anything without climate coming into it, even if the topic wasn't climate to begin with, which was never the case in the U.S. It used to be that at global meetings when the Europeans came over, then we might talk about climate, but no one in the US took it seriously. On infrastructure also, I think everybody agreed it was a good idea, but no one actually thought it would get done until now. And then that bill that every Senator is gonna get a piece of is, that's the whole bill. That's gonna be trillions of dollars, I think. Um, that's the goal at least. So, and, and on inequality, if you look at who the Biden administration has hired, it's a load of domestic labor economists. So again, economists, we have our faults, but at least they seem to be moving in a direction that recognizes some of these things that are actually a problem and are maybe quite urgent and should maybe start to be addressed now. So I do think that there has been a kind of a shift in the US at least in taking oh. these things seriously. I'm not sure the approach is right, but at least they're considered topics that we should actually do something about now, as opposed to in the last crisis when people felt like if, if you wanted to appear cuddly and smart, you would throw out these terms. <laughs> now, I agree with you to some extent. I think it's certainly in the conversation. What I want to see is more concrete results in some sense. So, you know, the conversation is certainly taking account of that, but the pushback is more silent than that in some sense. The guys who are against this and who don't want this I'm not uh, speaking out very loudly, um, except for the governor of Texas, I think it was, who said, you see, we really need oil. That, <laughs> yeah. that, was his, that was his conclusion about the snowstorm. We nearly need oil. Mm -hmm. if, we hadn't, if we'd been using more oil, we would have had more electricity and everything would have been wonderful. Mm. So, yeah, well, well, it doesn't freeze, thank God. Mm. Uh, Megan, can I just go quickly ask, how much is the um, Nordhaus type research still taken seriously? in terms of estimates of percentage of GDP damage and things like that? Uh, not very, I guess. <laughs> Good. Um, I, I'd like to get my paper on Nordhaus into that debate because the guy's a fraud and I've uh, been through the details of Harry. Have you, have you seen that paper at all? 
in globalizations? I'll send it to you through William. Okay. Literally, he assumed he literally assumed 87% of industry be unaffected by climate change because it happens indoors. Uh, I'm, I'm not joking. <laughs> Okay, now uh, I think we need to get a slap in the face to the politicians that have been taking this seriously. It might actually improve the chances of something sensible being done behind political doors. Yeah, good, but I mean, uh, also in Europe, the, the situation, I guess, is not really, really clear. Uh, uh, I think the politicians maybe don't have this awareness no, of, the mm. serious, uh, uh, of the situation, of the gravity of the situation. I mean, you know, in Germany, where you think, okay, we have here an enlightened society or a really cultivated society and so on. I think last year they, they decided to go out from the fossil, from the electricity, from fossil, from coal, 2038, mm -hmm. yeah? Compensating also all the, 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 the companies that are involved in that, yeah? And this is, uh, seems to me, uh, not really uh, long-term thinking, yeah? Uh, 2038, uh, many people are saying in 10 years, it will be like hell, you know? And considering that this pandemic is really uh, a really serious thing, but compared probably to climate change, it's kindergarten, I guess, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and this, I think, is really, really important to, 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 to understand. And I see, even in Germany, where, uh, maybe you think that politics is taking a little bit more serious. I'm coming from Italy, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, no, you don't see this awareness and you have always the feeling that the, 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 the lobbies are too big yeah, and too powerful. I mean, we, uh, we, in, the, in this pandemic, uh, there was a, a, little, a big discussion who to help in this crisis. And obviously, as an artist, no, we realized very soon that we are irrelevant to the system, yeah? that uh, we <laughs> don't need any help. Yeah? And at the same time, like a company like TUI, I don't know if you know that, uh, TUI got like 3 billion euros. Yeah? TUI is the company that is making charter uh, holidays, uh, going with cruise ships and so on. Uh, and that's obviously a little bit strange no, to realize that in a country like Germany, where you think, wow, no, we are how ma um, somehow in a, in, a, in a privileged situation. No, no we aren't, apparently. Mm. That's just still burning a lot of coal in uh, Germany. <coughs> because, mm. of course, paradoxically, the environmentalists pushed them to get out of nuclear. So, <laughs> anyway, mm, yeah. all parts of our complex system, guys. Yeah. But, uh, well, well, yeah. I was just William's question about the comparing the financial crisis with the COVID crisis. Huh? Again, I think maybe there's a, a fundamental difference in terms of the, the shock. Huh? I think maybe the shock in the financial crisis was one of you know, questionable ethics within financial institutions. Huh? But I think in the COVID crisis, there's a deep ethical crisis across all of society. Yeah, yep. it's exposed, you know, the ethical underpinnings of an awful lot of how we organize society huh? mm, need mm. to be fundamentally changed. So I think there's a groundswell, maybe there's a groundswell after this that there won't be, wouldn't have been after 2008. Yeah, I mean, one thing, Ian, is the, I think after the financial crisis, there was a sense that a lot of things needed to change in economics. And I think many things have changed, but it's been more in the direction of trying to fix up the discipline. And uh, as I mentioned, to try and add fixes and stitches to neoclassical frameworks rather than really uh, develop an alternative to that. And so, again, the, the question is whether this crisis will be severe enough to really displace uh, a lot of the conventional wisdom that we use in economics. And just the point about uh, the discussion Megan had with, uh, with Steve, I think Mark Blythe, uh, his distinction between formal models and folk models is very useful in the Nordhaus case, that maybe the issue is not the, the formal modeling of Nordhaus, but this idea, the folk model of climate, and it... Ah, oh, William, you've disappeared. Oh, William. lost you. Oh. William. Oh. You went down... You have, been, you have been censored by Nordhaus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we unmute him? Or just uh, no, we can't. We can't do that because uh, it it's, infringes. It's on time has gone down. I think. Fabio, right. your uh, your co-host, um, can you unmute him? No, not even the host can unmute somebody. I, I tried that 
as a as a professor, I cannot unmute my yeah. students because it infringes on their privacy. Uh, wow. Wow. Can I ask Steve a question about this yeah. crisis that he's predicting? Um, what role do private markets play in that? Because they're this like whole gargantuan behemoth in the U.S. at least that none of our bottles actually incorporate, but it could be quite scary. Yeah, I mean, I'm, what I'm looking at is bank debt there. So in terms of like leverage with um, CDOs and so on, I can't actually include that. I could get the data and take a look at it and see. But my feeling is that normally, like in 2008, that was all CDO kind of collateralized um, securities and so on, and enormous leverage and all the fragility that goes with that. This time, I think people are just being forced to dip into their lines of credit, whether that's MasterCards for individuals or literal lines of credit for companies to continue paying their current financial commitments. So rather than being having a boom, which you have with large amounts of credit before a, a slump like 2008, this is going to have a slump with no boom. That's my expectation. Uh, because you've taken all these extra commitments, cash flows come back to something close to, but not the same as normal. And therefore you won't be able to meet your commitments once all the various government supports for COVID are taken away. There's a ton of forbearance that no one knows how to account for as well. Um, Is there? Sorry, mm -hmm. I missed that. Maybe. There's a ton of forbearance. Right. So bills just aren't coming due right now, but will at some point. Yeah. Which could there, be a catalyst. There's a lot. I mean, a lot of, you know, for example, there have been eviction delays in America and the UK. Uh, but at the same time, tenants aren't paying their rent and, and mortgagees aren't paying their mortgage. So if you go to the stage of individuals thinking they can start enforcing that, then you can have a collapse in so social dislocation to begin with and a financial collapse as well. Uh, when the, the banks don't want to admit they've made bad debt for obvious reasons, they take over a property, it's worth one quarter what, they, what they've uh, valued the debt at at the time. And they're not set up to manage the cash flows of rent. They don't want to go about finding new tenants for vacant, vacant rental properties. So, There'll be ways in which they, you get pushed back to all this, but it will mean financial dislocation when it happens in the credit markets. And that's what I think is feasible next year or late this year. If we go back, Steve, if we go back to the previous crisis, what happened there? In fact, the sort of thing you're saying was actually going on, right? Because we had all these mortgage-backed securities that were being traded around happily but between people who weren't mm. busy uh, evaluating the underlyings. And... What happened in the end was, as property prices started to uh, drop, people got out because they'd, had, they'd hugely over leveraged. They simply mm. took their houses back to the bank. And that's exactly what you're saying. Banks find themselves with all these properties on there. And the, the value of those MBS just collapses. And that was mm. a, the sort of trigger. It wasn't the cause, but it was a trigger of that. So I think in mm. some sense, we're seeing a reflection of something similar. There were a lot of guys yeah. indebted on, on uh, houses and then their houses dropped in price, but that we should have seen it coming because you know everybody knew what the house price. Well, Schiller would, would tell you that, of course. But uh, so I think we're seeing sort of similar thing, but with all. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Yeah, with many. Uh, but because that's 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 not what the output gap model looking at, of course. No, no, no. no. <laughs> but uh, but even even the uh, models that are used internally by banks, I participated in a panel with uh, the banking industry here in Toronto a few weeks ago. And, and all the models are, are kind of uh, uh, disconnected from reality in the sense that uh, in, in, in making their models would look much worse than what's actually happening because they, they look at the things like unemployment rate and, and normally a uh, uh, drop oh, or an increase in unemployment uh, of the magnitude that happened would correlate with uh, credit card defaults or all sorts of other defaults. And, and they would be seeing a, a very big impact on their loan portfolio and, yeah. and nothing like that happened, right? So, so there was a big dip in, in employment, but their, their loans are fine. And, and that's because of what you're saying, Megan, the forbearance and, and then the assistance yeah. and, the, and the wage uh, replacement and business that have loans to continue to, to continue to subsidize wages and so in a sense they really have no clue what's going to happen when that retreats right so and, and this, out, yeah. is not, this is not going to happen in the next two months or three months it's it's going to be uh, a kind of a medium term uh, adjustment that is that is going to happen and and it's up for for everyone to guess but yeah, but i wanted yeah. to to just go back to the the idea of uh, you know what 
the possibilities created by this crisis, uh, I'm, I'm slightly uh, more optimistic, I think, than, than Alan. So I'm agreeing with Megan here that uh, uh, the crisis, the COVID crisis showed that many more things are possible than people were uh, uh, led to believe. For example, uh, going back to central banks, right? So uh, it, it, it used to be the case that, uh, you know, so, oh, Central banks cannot make loans to uh, corporations because you know that's interfering with the with the private system. They can only make loans to banks because otherwise, you know, moral hazard and this and that. They went out and bought corporate debt uh, left and right. They created a facility to buy corporate debt. Oh, mm-hmm. well, central banks cannot uh, support municipalities. Municipalities need to live within their budget. They went out and bought uh, municipal bonds and, and, and all those things. So uh, the, the other thing is uh, the, the false uh, trade-offs, right? So uh, I, I heard at the, the start of the crisis from my American friends, they're saying, oh, but you, you can't force people to be in lockdown uh, just to protect their health because that's going to throw them into poverty, right? And I said, mm-hmm. well, only in your country and, 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 and <laughs> you know, it's, it doesn't have to be like that. It's not a choice between uh, uh, death and poverty. Uh, you can stay home safely and still have an income and that has been done in many other countries and, and, and you just, you don't need a model, you don't need to theorize, you just need to open your eyes and look around at what different countries uh, have done. So, so this kind of argument that you know, uh, do this or else, uh, it, it's it's much weaker uh, after the crisis. Still uh, of course, people people will try will try again uh, all sorts mm. of uh, you know oh. But but now inflation is going to return. Uh, but but the the natural reaction now is to laugh at these people instead of uh, take take it very seriously, right? You you need to actually show evidence that this is happening. Oh, you know, uh, uh, bond markets are going to rebel against uh, the increase in government spending. It hasn't happened in in ten years, mate. So why why is it going to happen now? <laughs> oh, oh. So 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 I think uh, the the and 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 it's important. To have this kind of switch points, right? Uh, because uh, so I was reading recently the most recent book by PKT on on uh, ideology, and and he he tells that that you know a very strong argument for even small change against even small change is the slippery slope argument, right? Mm-hmm. So for example, uh, uh, income tax had been discussed since the beginning of the French Revolution. They were trying to have income tax. But the argument was always, oh no, you can't possibly tax uh, income even in small amounts, you know, half a percent, one percent, because once you start doing a little bit of redistribution, you know, wh- when is it going to stop? And then, you know, in, in the uh, beginning of the 1900s, they did do income tax and they increased and, and it stopped at some point. So right? it doesn't go to infinity. So we are smart uh, uh, people. We can tell the difference between zero and infinity and somewhere in between. And, and, and I think what, what is going to happen with COVID is that we're going to pass beyond this point of, uh, you, you, you know, we cannot do because then we don't know when when it's going to stop. We're going to show when to stop, and it's going to stop when needed. But keep going, keep going with spending, keep going with that, keep going with uh, uh, supporting uh, people uh, that are out of jobs, and 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 then stop when 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 it's necessary. Right? But you know, uh, Matthias, I agree with you entirely. But there are sort of people who are so hung up on their positions. Any movement in this direction. For example, why did the Republicans immediately try and vote against any uh, huge bill to uh, for recovery? Because they didn't want to pay any money to states or cities, right? They said, you know, we are not prepared to underwrite states or uh, cities and local governments. And they got hung up on that. And but, you know, from your argument, (laughs) that would have stopped at some point. We, we, we do actually, I mean, even in the US, we, you do actually underwrite cities in the end when they get into bad enough trouble. But why should that be somehow a moral sticking point or a, uh, a, a, a you know, even a theoretical sticking point? I, I, but so I think people do have, unfortunately, these frictions. But Megan, I, 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 uh, I convey the impression that I am extremely cynical and pessimistic, but in fact, <laughs> And by nature, I'm rather optimistic. 
And I'm not by nature, but he, <laughs> I am the optimist, which is the weirdest position for me uh, to be. And I will, can I just say in response to um, what Matthias was saying about, you know, tiny steps being sea changes, um, we're not there yet. So in my conversations with central banks about using their new tools for climate change or inequality, they mainly look at me like I have 40 heads and are completely horrified. And immediately roll out the slippery slope argument. So I think you're right. Central banks are kind of stuck in this weird middle ground between monetary and fiscal policy, but they're not willing to admit it yet. So I think there's a ways to go before we get there. Agreed. That's true. Probably push back. You couldn't find a few exceptions, Megan, who, who do see through this a bit, more, a bit further? Um, I would say the ECB is more open to it than the Fed, but um, partly because they've already created the tools to, to use with Teltros. Um, and I think also partly because the climate discussion is so much further ahead in Europe than it is in the US, but, um, but even they're pretty tentative. But, uh, but, but it's not so the small steps, right? Uh, what, what the crisis did is because it was of such magnitude that all of a sudden, Many different things uh, happen that people were not paying attention. So, so for example, I, I, one of my pet uh, ideas is, is narrow banking. Uh, I, I don't uh, particularly think that it's the solution to all problems, but I would like people to analyze the idea in more details, not dismiss it out of hand. And, and, and one of the arguments for dismissing narrow banking out of hand is, oh, you'll never be able to raise as much reserves as the amount of deposits that are there because you know deposits are much larger than, than reserves. It's gonna be hugely, uh, uh, you, you know, a dislocation from the banks to have to do that. Well, look at the data now and the banks in the US and in Canada, they now have more reserves than deposits. So if you wanted to implement narrow bank tomorrow, that would be, make no, no difference to the level of reserves that the banks have. So it's just that kind of thing, like be, because it was such a, a, a gigantic shock in, in financial and, and economic terms, uh, you can revisit old arguments and say, oh, really? You thought that this was impossible? Here it is, it's not impossible. So maybe these other things are not impossible as well. But we, we, we'll undoubtedly keep coming back to the minimum wage story, right? And that is exactly the same thing with some people that simply, as soon as you say that, oh, we're never going to employ anybody at those wages. But the evidence seems to be so far that in fact, raising minimum wages had very little impact on employment and in some places positive uh, uh, impact. So, you know, but I think these are sort of relics from people's, the way people have been trained and brought up and thought about things, right? But right at the beginning, we, somebody we, uh, said something about um, uh, we should be looking at what's actually going on, what people are doing. Was it you, Mathias? Uh, uh, and, and not so much about uh, worrying about what these sophisticated people have in their minds. And uh, I think uh, it was Herb Simon who kept saying, you know, why don't we stop thinking about how we believe a very sophisticated person would uh, build his expectations and build models of that and start looking at how people do form their expectations, for example. And I think that's something we have ceased to do. And, and he argued that people were much simpler than uh, the things that we attribute to them. So uh, perhaps we should go back to this very simple world and, um, and say, you know, let's put all together, put together guys with simple rules. People like Gerd Gigerenzer would be very happy, you know, heuristics. Everything is heuristics. Nobody actually thinks, they just have heuristics. <laughs> we're probably in between. But anyway, I mean, I think we, that's what we've done. We've made these such elaborate models and come to conclusions. And now we find it very difficult to get rid of the conclusions. Uh, by we, I mean, everybody, right? More yeah. or less. Okay, we're almost uh, at time. Uh, I think we've oscillated from between more positive, optimistic take and maybe more negative, pessimistic uh, approach to what's going to happen with the recovery and what implications that's going to have for economics and policy. But does anyone want uh, a parting word? Oh, can a I final... ask a question as a parting word, William? What, yeah. what, what was your objective? I mean, what did you <laughs> after this, us to come up with, or we to come up with? 
Well, uh, so Matthias and us and I and you actually, Alan, are on the organizing committee of a, a whole set of meetings around yeah. systemic recovery uh, with the Fields Institute. And um, maybe Matthias, you want to say a word about that and where we're going and how this conversation is quite useful uh, in our thinking for planning that event. Yeah, it's, it's extremely useful. So, so we are going to have, uh, we're going to start with what we are calling an extended problem solving uh, workshop, which uh, is, is going to be a group of students and postdocs, though we, the, the, it's currently open for students and postdocs to apply. So if you guys have uh, networks that you can advertise this to, uh, please do. And, and, and they, they are going to be working on problems that have been suggested by the OECD, by the Bank of Canada, by the finance uh, department, uh, Julian is off the call, but, but the, the Department of Finance in Canada's participation, and, and the local bank here in, in, well, not a local bank, a Canadian bank, Scotia Bank in Toronto. So there are problems coming from different perspectives, and, and they all have to do with uh systemic recovery and so they cover things like uh comparison of what happens in different countries uh what what uh, worked and what didn't work but from a quantitative and, and empirically based uh, view not you know what ought to have worked uh, what what is going to happen in in the medium term like what what steve was talking about once those instruments are, are taken out the, the support instruments are taken out what's going to happen to the economy and then what's going to happen in the in the very long term, the, uh, the sustainability, uh, what what the uh, if there is a different track, like what Alan was was talking about. And so so the students are going to be working on practical uh, data sets and, and questions posed by those organizations and, and trying to use all sorts of different modeling uh, uh, techniques. To, to come up with uh, with frameworks to think about that, not necessarily answers, but frameworks. And then and then that's gonna take three weeks and, and I'm very excited about that. It's gonna be like, uh, you know, all over the world, it's gonna be online. We're expecting that people are gonna be communicating morning and, and evenings on, 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 you know, online platforms with uh, mentors, professors, that are going to be just just guiding what the students are doing. So it's going to be uh, exciting but hard work. And then after that, there's a two day symposium where we're going to have different panels with uh, with uh, senior academics that are going to be discussing exactly those questions, uh, maybe informed by what's coming up of the workshop. And 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 then uh, this all will lead to. So this is still a two day symposium, more or less. Uh, um, you know, centered on modeling and, and analytics and, and, and suggestions and recommendations from policy for policy. But then it all culminates with a, a high level panel discussion at the OECD uh, with, uh, uh, you, you know, people that would listen to the recommendations of, of these uh, experts uh, and try to implement them in, in actual policy. So, so it's a whole, uh, you know, menu of different uh, activities, but all centered on those systemic recovery questions. Oh. Great, and we hope you'll all join us uh, in help, helping to further articulate that agenda and maybe to put together some ideas on how we could um, influence the policy agenda uh, in the direction of a more systemic approach uh, based on new economic thinking and acting. Uh, so uh, we're, we're at time. So I'd just like to, uh, Ian, did you want to say something? Just very quickly, yeah. Um, I think a suggestion maybe for a future conversation huh? is the paradigm shift that, that Beyond Growth Report points to. Uh, mm. Is that possible within the economics profession? Because mm. uh, I don't think economics is like physics, huh? You know, in physics, the ideas are the primary currency. There are power structures and so forth. And, but I think that's much, much more prevalent within economics. And I think there's a really fundamental question as to whether a type of paradigm shift can be brought about within, in thinking can be brought about within the economic profession alone. Ian, I should send you a quote from Frank Hahn, who was a hardline general equilibrium theorist. And he said, I don't think, he was asked what will happen to economics in the, uh, in the next century, that is this century. And he said, I don't believe that ec uh, economists will be able to prove any serious results or give much good advice. The world of the future is gonna be in simulation, comp computational models and with simple uh, actors and so forth. And everybody was deeply shocked by this. But I think in some sense, 
I, I think there are a lot of sufficiently intelligent economists to move along with that and maybe and then get off the track. But, uh, um, but I, anyway, you, you think that the economist profession is dead. Is that what you're telling me? No, no, I, I don't think it's dead. Huh? Not dead enough, I think, might be the actual point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but I think there is a, a past dependence that uh, makes it difficult to bring in other ideas and other the types of paradigm. Mm, that that's where they're dead. Yeah. 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 But that's well. Uh, oh well, that's what um, well, Max Planck said. That new ideas don't take over because the older guys have learned that they are interesting and, and then uh, purvey them. No, they take over because the old guys die and they're replaced by younger people who are open to these ideas. So yeah, the, the actual, the actual, actual quote, quote is that bad news for people like me. Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> the actual quote is that science progresses one funeral at a time. No, that's another quote. That's a different that's quote. That's not the no, real no. quote. That's the paraphrase. I've right. got the actual, I've got Max Planck's autobiography. The, it's a para, that's the paraphrase. But the point is it doesn't happen in economics because they want the zombie ideas to continue. So you don't, you don't get the, uh, that's the first chapter of my new book, Matt, Matthias, as you'll find out uh, on Sunday. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody. I think we need to uh, leave it there, but uh, thanks so much for contributing. And uh, I think uh, there'll be an edited version of this conversation that'll be on the Age of Economics website. I think Fabio, uh, is that right? Do you wanna? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it would be really great, uh, obviously, uh, to share this. Uh, um, in the next days, we, I think we will make also a transcript. Uh, so for people who doesn't want to watch, they can read, yeah? uh, and maybe they get inspired a little bit yeah, by our conversation. It would be great. And we'll great. put the link up on Twitter as well. Okay. Great. Yeah. yeah okay. We will. We will, we will uh, tell exactly when this will happen with the with the, with this uh, transcript and with the video on the website. Yeah. We will okay. manage to. Wonderful. Well, thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks and very much from my side. Yeah. It was really great. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Fabio. Bye. Thanks, thanks, Take care. Bye. All. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.